Hi, I'm Sarah Morehouse. I'm a librarian at SUNY Empire State College, and while I can't give legal advice, I'm a copyright specialist. The U.S. Constitution gives the government the authority and responsibility to, quote, promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries, unquote. The copyright law is meant to encourage people to create new ideas and inventions by giving them a limited monopoly so they can earn a profit from their work. The purpose of copyright, as it is written into the Constitution, is to promote intellectual and technological progress for the benefit of society as a whole. The author's profits are only an incentive for them to continue creating more works. Copyright law is about balancing the author's need to make money with society's need for progress. And for progress to happen, people need to be able to share knowledge and create works based on other works. So while copyright has to protect the author's right to control and profit from their own work, it also has to have loopholes so that people can still use those works under certain conditions. What kinds of things can be copyrighted? A work does not have to be published, and it doesn't have to have a copyright notice or symbol anywhere on it. It doesn't have to be registered with the U.S. Copyright Office. In fact, there are only two requirements for a work to be copyrighted. First, it has to be a work of original authorship. That means it can't be just information, facts, or data. It has to have some of the author's own brain work put into it. Ideas can't be copyrighted. Only the expression of ideas can be copyrighted. It has to have an element of organization or creativity. Second, it has to be fixed in a tangible medium of expression. That means that it has to be put into a form that can be passed along independent of human beings. It can be written, recorded, saved to disk, or posted online. As soon as it is set down in some way, it is copyrighted. What rights does copyright give the copyright owner? The copyright owner has the exclusive right to make copies, to sell, share, or otherwise distribute copies of their work, to perform or display their work in a public setting, and to make and distribute new works based on the original one. Those are called derivative works, and that category includes translations, new editions, adaptations, sequels, spin-offs, remixes, mashups, and supplementary materials. Finally, the copyright owner has the right to license others to do any of those things. A copyright can also be sold, given away, or seized as an asset. When a copyright owner dies, the copyright becomes part of their estate. There are two legal exemptions to copyright that commonly apply in a nonprofit educational setting. Those are classroom use and fair use. Classroom use applies under very specific circumstances. First of all, it has to take place within a nonprofit institution of education. It has to be in a face-to-face -face classroom, and it has to be part of the actual teaching and learning. It can't be for a conference, meeting, or extracurricular activity. Finally, classroom use only applies to performance and display. You can't make or share copies under the classroom use exemption, so it doesn't apply to making handouts. What it does apply to is playing any kind of audio-video recording, reading out loud, and performing dramatic and musical works. There are no limitations on what kind of material is performed or displayed, or how much of it. It doesn't matter whether you got the material from the library or purchased it, found it on the web, or had it in your personal collection. The classroom use exemption does not apply to online learning. For that, there's the TEACH Act. The TEACH Act requires an educational institution to meet a variety of requirements both in terms of technology and policy. Once the institution complies with those requirements, faculty are allowed to embed multimedia in the learning management system under certain circumstances that are considered parallel to classroom use. Basically, as long as the college is doing everything that can be expected to prevent illegal copying and sharing, the TEACH Act allows you to embed whole songs or documentaries and clips from fictional or dramatic works as long as they are legal copies and you clearly state their copyright status. Materials published for the educational market, like textbooks and their supplemental materials, are excluded. 
Some SUNY institutions are TEACH Act compliant, while others are not. So consult your college's administration to find out if you're allowed to embed copyrighted multimedia in online courses under its provisions. Neither the Classroom Use Exemption nor the TEACH Act are applicable if you want to use something in an open educational resource. The reason for that is that you can't be sure in what context your OER will be made available and used. It's definitely not going to be limited to classrooms and learning management systems in nonprofit educational institutions. The second big exemption to copyright that often applies in nonprofit educational environments is fair use. Fair use is the most flexible and ambiguous exemption, and it's that way because it needs to be able to provide a loophole for people to use copyrighted materials in socially valuable ways without having to ask for permission or pay royalties. Balancing the social value against the needs of the copyright owner is key, and that balance is determined based on the balance of four factors. The first factor, the purpose and character of your use, gets right to the heart of the matter of social value. Uses that are considered socially valuable enough to weigh against the needs of the copyright owner are criticism and commentary, news reporting, education, and research. If your use falls into any of these categories, then as long as your other three factors aren't too bad, you probably have a fair use. Transformative works are also generally considered fair use. A transformative work is a kind of derivative work that totally changes the original work. It has a different purpose and a different form. While it may have started out as someone else's work, you put so much of your own original expression into it that you've made it your own and it can't possibly substitute or be mistaken for the original. And again, if your work is clearly transformative, as long as your other three factors aren't too bad, you probably have a fair use. Making a single copy of something for personal use, such as photocopying an article in the library, or ripping your CDs so you can put your songs on an iPod, is fair use. So is performing a song or playing a DVD for friends and family in your house. So on to those other three factors. The second factor is the nature and character of the work being used. Using a non-fiction work is more favorable to fair use than using a fictional, artistic, or dramatic work. Using a published work is more favorable to fair use than using someone else's unpublished raw material. The third factor is the amount and substantiality of the portion of the work that is taken. There is no number of words or pages that's considered too much. There's no percentage that's considered too much. But even if you take a very tiny portion, it could still be too much if what you're taking is the heart of the work. If what you use is the part of the work that makes it uniquely valuable on the market, then that counts against a fair use decision even if you use only a small amount. A recent federal court decision established that when you are using something for educational purposes within a nonprofit educational institution, one chapter of a full-length book, or 10% of any other kind of source, is a safe amount to use. More than that, and you need to look very carefully at the other three factors. The fourth factor is the effect on the market for the original work and also on the market for potential future derivative works based on the original. If a book is out of print, or there is no way to contact the copyright owner to get a license, that may be helpful to you for this factor. Any effort you make to prevent further copying and redistribution, like putting it behind a password, will also be helpful for this factor. On the other hand, what will really hurt you is if you make a copy or a derivative work available to the public in a way that might substitute for the original work. Fair use is especially complicated online because making and sharing copies is so easy in this environment, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. If you did really well on the first factor and okay on the second two factors, then simply the fact that it takes place online doesn't have to mean that it's not a fair use. So to sum up, the four factors are purpose and character of the use, nature of the work being used, amount and substantiality of the portion being used, 
and effect on the market for the original work and its potential derivative works. Remember that the purpose of these factors is to help you think through the balance between how much society stands to benefit from your use and the copyright owners need to be compensated for their work. No one of these factors is a deal breaker. If you use a small portion of a non-fictional work for educational purposes, and particularly if you use it in a way that's transformative, you have a very strong case for fair use. In the context of open educational resources, you have to remember that you are not operating within an accredited institution of higher education, and you have to assume that your work will be available to the public without any restrictions. However, if you can still make a strong case that using something in your OER would be fair use, go ahead and do it. But it does need to be very positive on the first three factors. The reason for that is that it will be out there for everyone to use, which makes it potentially very bad on the fourth factor. The next thing I want to talk about is works that are not protected by copyright, which are in the public domain. Works are in the public domain either because they originated there, as some federal government publications do, or because their copyright has expired. Works that are in the public domain are not protected by copyright. They are free to be used by anyone in any way, without getting permission or paying royalties. It's important to remember that simply because something has no information about the author or copyright status doesn't mean that it's in the public domain. And just because something is available for free doesn't mean that it's in the public domain. The right to read or watch something is not the same as the right to copy or reuse it. Another thing that's come up in recent years is the proliferation of online resources, especially educational resources, that are labeled royalty-free or sometimes even copyright-free. They're actually still protected by copyright, it's just that they're available for use under certain conditions. You need to read those conditions and comply with them. Otherwise the license is void and you're in violation of copyright. Rules about when works fall into the public domain are incredibly complicated. The international rules are different from the US rules. And the US rules have changed multiple times. And each time existing works were grandfathered under the older set of rules. So if you want to establish whether a work is in the public domain, you need to know where it was published and in what year, and use a tool like the Public Domain Helper from Empire State College's Copyright Information website. The short answer is, if it was published before 1909 anywhere, it's in the public domain. And if it was published before 1923 in the United States, it's in the public domain. If it was published after that, you need to look it up. Of course, it is always absolutely legal to use public domain works in your open educational resources. The last topic I want to talk about is getting a license to use a copyrighted work. If the work that you want to use in whole or in part is not in the public domain, and your use doesn't fall under the educational use or the fair use exemption, you will need to get permission, which is also known as getting a license. There are multiple types of licenses. One is the kind of user agreement that college libraries sign with database vendors, which allows faculty, staff, and students within that college to access the contents of the databases. These kinds of licenses are fine when you're providing links to students at your institution, but they generally place severe limitations on embedding content. Also, they prohibit use outside the institution so they will not be applicable if you're creating an open educational resource. Another type of license is the type you get when you go through the Copyright Clearance Center or other rights management agency, or go to the copyright owner directly to get permission to use the work. When I say get permission, it means the same thing as get a license. Usually the terms of the license involve paying royalties. Sometimes they're a trivial amount, but you need to be prepared for some pretty staggering figures. If you're creating an open educational resource, that's basically an unrestricted audience for an unlimited amount of time, so it could potentially be very expensive, even though it's a nonprofit educational use. On the other hand, some copyright owners will be very helpful when they find out what you want to do with their work, 
and sometimes they'll give you a license for free or for a token amount. There's no way to know unless you ask. Another possibility is that the work you want to use is published under a Creative Commons license. While you have to go out and get and often pay for a regular license, a Creative Commons license is given by the copyright owner to anyone and everyone by default for free. But the same as any other license, if you violate its terms, you void it and can still be liable for copyright infringement. The next section of this pursuit will talk about Creative Commons licenses in detail. If you are still curious about copyright, you can find out more at the Empire State College Copyright Information website. It is located at www.esc.edu copyright.